If you would have asked me five years ago what the on-trend brewing thing would be in 2021, I never would have guessed that hard seltzer water would be so popular. Laugh all you want, but hard seltzer is a fantastic day drinker and likely isn't going anywhere in the near future. Imperial Yeast's new seasonal strain, W04 Paramount, can help brewers get the most out of their seltzer fermentations. A clean and aggressive fermenter, Paramount will produce an excellent seltzer with low fusel alcohols and it's produced in a gluten-free medium. If you've tried making seltzer with standard ale or lager strains, you know the struggle, and Imperial Yeast is here to help with W04 Paramount. Check it out at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. Brewers are always looking to push the boundaries of traditional beer making, to find new flavors and to improve the brewing process. So when Masters candidate Grady Hull released research about using olive oil in lieu of oxygenating wort, many brewers, including myself, became interested in trying it out for themselves. I'm your host, Cade Job, and today in the lab, I'm speaking with Dr. Lance Shainer, an owner and founder of Omega Yeast. So Lance has studied yeast for a while and actually owns a yeast lab. Um, so like many, he was initially Initially intrigued about using olive oil to replace oxygen, but when you dig a little deeper, he noticed that there are some holes in the underlying science. So yeast needs oxygen to form unsaturated fatty acids and ergosterol for reasons that we'll get into in the show. But olive oil, it turns out, has a lot of unsaturated fatty acids because, well, it's oil. <laughs> but olive oil doesn't have ergosterol, and ergosterol is a compound that must be synthesized by yeast. It requires oxygen for yeast to make it. So after reading Grady Hull's research, an experiment article that I performed, and an experiment, um, an experimental brewing Igor experiment, Lance realized that there's sort of a misunderstanding, at least online, um, about how olive oil could be used to replace oxygenation. And so this prompted him to write a blog post on Omega Yeast's new website, which is called Top Crop. Uh, Top Crop is a place where researchers share knowledge about modern brewing science. Um, and so Lance wrote an article about whether or not we can use olive oil to replace oxygenation. And in today's episode, that's what I'm going to talk to him about. Well, we're in full swing in the holiday of the holiday season here in the United States, and I've got my lights and tree up, and I'm reminded uh, this time of year of all the things I'm thankful for, which includes Marshall and all the crew here at Brewlosophy, all of our listeners and all of our patrons. And if you haven't yet considered becoming a patron, please visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By becoming a patron, you'd be directly supporting the work that we do here. That includes uh, a weekly experiment and a secondary series article like the Hop Chronicles, Brew It Yourself, Shorten shoddy two podcasts per week uh and if you haven't subscribed yet to the brulosophy show youtube channel you might want to do that at youtube.com slash the brulosophy show uh and, but uh, and and if you want to become a patron you also get access to a whole bunch of unique rewards discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com a monthly live q a session with somebody from the industry um and much much more and your support through patreon helps keep all this going so thank you to all of those uh those of you who have already joined, and if you haven't yet, please consider it by visiting patreon.com slash brewlosophy. The other great way to support us during the holiday season is to use the affiliate links listed at brewlosophy.com slash support. When doing your online shopping, it's an easy way to support us. It doesn't impact your shopping experience. All you have to do is start with the link, and then we get a small click kickback from your purchase. Uh, you can check out all of our affiliates at brewlosophy.com slash support. Feedback this week is brought to you by the imaginative crew at Haas, who have developed a revolutionary way to dry hop using Spectrum, a flowable 100% hop-derived product that's fully dispersible in cold side applications for great flavor, efficiency, and less beer loss. No solids means less loss, and it's fully dispersible in cold beer, so there's no contact or residency time required like traditional dry hopping. Spectrum fully disperses immediately, so you don't need to wait 24 to 48 hours or worry about double dry hopping, and you don't have to have any special dry hopping equipment. It stores easily, it's easy to use, saving you precious time and getting instant aroma in each batch. It's currently available to commercial brewers in trial quantities of Citra and Mosaic, so check it out by visiting johnihaas.com. That's john, the letter I-H-A-A-S.com. 
All right, listener Finn wrote in with a question about yeast starters. He says, I'm rather interested in what's going on in starters, so I've got a question about the crab tree effect. I know that fermentation is not completely shut off, even in low sugar aerobic conditions, but is the same true about respiration in high sugar conditions? I've actually been taught that there's still some respiration going on, even in a 1040 starter on a stir plate where air is mixed in, and that that explains the higher growth rate you get with a stir plate. Uh, So hi, Finn. Thanks for that awesome question. Uh, You know, it's a really interesting one, whether there's still respiration occurring, uh, you know, in a high OG starter. And I think this is in relation to uh, the episode, episode 62 that I did with Dr. Maria Mutzaglu um, about carbon to nitrogen ratios in yeast propagation. Um, And so I asked her this question a while back. Um, about the cra- crab tree effect um, and the cra- the crab tree effect at the cellular level, and this is her response. So she says the crab tree effect does occur at a single cell level. So a crab tree positive yeast cell can utilize both respiration and fermentation pathways at the same time. Cells will modulate their own behavior by sensing their extracellular and intracellular environment, where things like ATP concentrations, sugar concentration, type of sugar or carbon source available. Um, noting that some carbon sources do not allow for the fermentation pathway, nutrient content, et cetera, it can all influence the respirofermentative balance. So cells are not locked into a certain pathway once they begin using it. So yeah, Finn, I think there's a very direct answer. Yes, there can be some respiration going on even in a 1040 stir plate. I'm not sure that it explains the higher growth rate that you get with a stir plate, but possible. Um, you know, uh, It could also be a timing thing or, or, or who knows exactly, but maybe it is. Maybe there is um, some of that respiration that's occurring and thus um, a higher growth rate. Uh, but it sounds like, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, for sure there can def- there can be respiration occurring in high gravity starters and vice versa uh, with fermentation in low gravity starters. So cool question. And thanks for sending it in. All right. I'm going to take a quick break and then I'll be back with Dr. Lance Shainer talking about olive oil and oxygenation. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need Need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the Times IPA was expected to be bitter and clear. And there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the west and the east coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than morebeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. When I first heard about using olive oil in beer in lieu of oxygenation, I thought, this sounds really weird, but I'm interested. And things like this always seem to grab headlines, but I often wonder, is there any science that's supporting it? So here with me in the lab today to answer these questions is Dr. Lance Shainer, an owner and founder of Omega Yeast. So Lance, welcome to the Brew Lab. Thanks. I'm excited to be here and uh, looking forward to talking about this topic with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, and first of all, you guys are re- up to some really fun stuff over at Omega Yeast. I mean, I've had your director of research, Laura Burns, on the show a couple of times. We talked about uh, style one diastatic yeast, and we talked about all the work that she and Keith did with yeast dependent haze. Um, it's pretty fantastic work. So keep it up. That's uh, greatly appreciated. It's definitely been, uh, research has been a, uh, and will continue to be a huge focus on what we do. I mean, we put a lot of uh, resources into 
brewing science and just answering questions that are still unknown. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love it. I mean, that's a great one, too. I mean, when I talked to Laura about the yeast dependent haze one, I mean, that was a whole deal, right? A brewer's coming to you going, hey, we're trying to make hazy beers, but they're not hazy. <laughs> What's going on? Um, and you guys put together this whole thing about, you know, haze positive and haze negative and haze neutral yeast. I just think that's fantastic. And it's a incredibly useful piece of information for brewers. So I really appreciate it. But this episode's about olive oil and oxygenation. So why did you decide to write an article on this topic? Uh, I'd say we have a somewhat of a history of kind of myth busting. Um, like very early on, um, there was kind of this notion that you could do 100% lacto fermentation uh, based on uh, a blog post. And I knew that that was, you know, not correct. <laughs> uh, but there were enough people out there that had read this and were trying to do it. And of course, like sometimes working, sometimes not. And the reason it, that lacto can't do that. And I knew that. So I'm like, well, we just got to get this, you know, do the experiment that is set up properly and, and show this to people. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we did that. And the same thing with the twa when it used to be uh, considered a Saccharomyces, we knew it wasn't acting like one, looked more into it. and or Sorry, it was supposed to be a breath. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. we looked into it. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is... <laughs> Somebody's wrong on the internet. We need to <laughs> we need to go and, and address that, uh, kind of that notion. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, so I was intrigued by this whole idea uh, enough to like really dive into it. Um, and the more I read about it, I'm like, this isn't going to work. I mean, there are some fundamental reasons why this is not going to work. Yeah, exactly. I love that too. And, and and this is a really fun episode for me too, because I did a brewlosophy experiment on this um, where I compared an olive oil batch um, and a non-olive oil uh, addition batch. And we'll talk about that experiment here in a little bit. But it's a fun one for me too, because whenever I, like I said, when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, cool. I'd love to try this. And so I did um, and had some interesting results, but there were some problems uh, with the way that I did it. And we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about some of the other experience uh, experiments that people have done um, with olive oil and oxygenation. Um, but first, I always want to hear about you. So you have a PhD in biomedical sciences from the University of Texas Health Center, Health Science Center at Houston, uh, and then also a JD, uh, a Juris Doctorate from the University of Houston, and apparently worked in an IP law firm for about four years. So um, first of all, it's really cool to talk to another former lawyer that made the switch to beer. Uh, but what made you want to open a uh, yeast manufacturing company? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, into beer in college, like a lot of uh, people are. That's where I kind of <laughs> you know, yeah. got that connection. And at the University of Illinois, we had a really good uh, homebrew club that was actually a university sanctioned club at the time. It's not anymore. It's uh, they, I think the university maybe didn't see the wisdom in having a, a club whose focus is on making and drinking beer. So the club <laughs> still exists, but it's not a university club. But oh, you know, well. thankfully, it was at the time. Uh, so that's how I got into making beer, um, and then ended up studying microbiology in college, and then uh, same thing in graduate school, studying yeast um, in the more of the human health context. Uh, but still, just a lot of hands-on experience with yeast and with um, you know, manipulating them genetically and things like that. So that's, uh, so remained connected in that way. Uh, but yes, then took a detour to law school uh, with the goal of being a patent attorney. So I, you know, I had confidence based on talking to others that if I, you know, made it through law school, that it'd be fairly easy to get a job because it's, you've got a lot of specialized training at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got, you know, the um, science and you've got the law and you basically become the go-between between an between inventor and the patent office and convey their invention into a legal language. So it's kind of a unique skill set that it pays pretty well. Um, so it's, and I was just getting a little, uh, I don't know, just the, the thought of academia wasn't uh, appealing at that point, just seeing how much it, effort it took to beg for money all the time hmm. um, to yeah. be able to do your research, <laughs> That's um, true. which is frankly depressing that we uh, don't, you know, just put that much, put more resources toward it. So more people can be doing science. It's uh, hugely beneficial to society, but it's, it's a fight and a struggle. Mm -hmm. And I guess I wasn't up for that fight. So uh, just took a detour to law school and, and that, it did that for like four years as a patent attorney, biotech, um, and enjoyed it, enjoyed my colleagues, uh, but was just getting a little burned out um, and ended up having a, a really chance conversation with one of my colleagues at the firm who was a, a co-founder of 1090 Brewing in the Chicago suburbs. Oh. Uh, so, I mean, I can literally 
point to that conversation as being the inspiration to start Omega East because it wasn't in my thought process until then. It, my, my thought process was I'm getting bored being a patent attorney. Uh, and I just had this conversation and just kind of like, wow, there's nobody else doing this around here. Chicago, the brew scene is growing. Like we, we could probably do this by just, you know, servicing Chicago and kind of looking at things in uh, a different way. And um, so just, just took that leap. It was really out of uh, a result of ennui. Uh, <laughs> why, why Omega Yeast exists. Wow, that's amazing. I, I love that. Man, I'm, just, I'm sitting here nodding my head the whole time because I'm just like, I'm like, oh, yeah, mm hmm. Yep, I feel that way. Yep, mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have the, the PhD. I didn't do the PhD before, uh, you know, before law school. I went straight from undergrad as a business student uh, into law school and then into family law for a number of years, seven years. Uh, and now trying to work on my master's and PhD with Tom Shellhammer here at Oregon State. Uh, but it's really cool. I'm just like nodding my head along. It's like, yeah, I enjoy my time there. I enjoyed my colleagues, but I was getting a little burnout on some things and looking for something different. Um, and that's really cool. So you opened up a yeast manufacturing company and you, you mentioned something in there about research, right? Funding for research is certainly difficult. We're not going to go off on that tangent for this podcast, but, uh, but one of the cool things, and again, I mentioned at the top of the show is you guys' commitment is Omega's yeast's commitment to research. Um, and an interesting uh, point that I wanted to bring up here at the top of the show is how I found um, you as a guest for this olive oil versus oxygen uh, episode. And that's this cool uh, blog that you guys have set up. It's a, it's called Top Crop, and it's an investigation into brewing science, uh, you know, published by Omega Yeast. It's a pretty cool resource. Yeah, I mean, it's really kind of our outlet for the experiments we do, for the education that we want to get across, for opinions, for just, you know, little uh, nuggets like this olive oil stuff that doesn't necessarily involve you know, experiments we did, it's just kind of collation of the existing research, um, you know, opinions, recipes, just kind of a forum for us to get all that stuff out there because we do put a lot of effort into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think the most recent one I just saw is, uh, uh, was published last month, um, is a lab basics on a budget. You've it's in, in your brewer's education, uh, you know, uh, setting. So if you're a brewer out there and looking to how to trying to figure out, you know, how do we start a micro program or how do we start a quality program, you know, lab basics on a budget, there's a step-by-step -step guide there, um, uh, to, to look it up. So it's really cool. Um, and so again, I found it there. Uh, I was, I just happened to be perusing top crop and I came across this olive oil versus, uh, oxygenation. I was like, yes, finally, I would love to see, um, you know, if we can get him on the show and talk about it. And of course we can. So the goal of your article article was to discuss the science behind yeast yeast growth and how olive oil might or might not play a role. An emphasis here on the might not. Uh, we're going to spend um, the first half of the show talking about biology. Um, so it's like the role of unsaturated fatty acids and er er ergosterol. Um, that's how I'm going to pronounce it. Um, and then uh, and and how each of these are are synthesized. And in the second half of the show, we're going to look at some experiments, including my experiment looking at olive oil use in a colch, the New Belgium experiment that kicked off this whole discussion back in I don't know two thousand five or something like that. Um, and then uh, finally decide whether it's realistic to use olive oil in place of oxygenation. So it's going to be a pretty fascinating episode. And let's start with the overarching claim. So what's the theory dealing with olive oil and oxygenation? Um, <clears throat> so the theory, and I think you'll see why it breaks down kind of right from the start, is that we, we agree on the premise that yeast need unsaturated fatty acids and ergosterol. Uh, we agree that oxygen is needed to make those things if you're going if the yeast is going to make them from scratch. So therefore, we could take a source of unsat unsaturated fatty, fatty acids uh, like olive oil and and just supplement that need. Now you'll notice I did not mention ergosterol in the second half of that, mm. and that's where things break down. So olive oil supplies unsaturated fatty acids, namely uh, oleic acid. It does not supply ergosterol. Ergosterol is a completely different compound. It's not in the same pathway. It's not present in olive oil. 
So, you know, if your premise is you need both and olive oil only supplies one, it's broken from the start. Yeah, that's right. It, well, and that's such a great, succinct way to put this, right? Because the claim is always, yeah, we can just pitch olive oil, or I'm sorry, you know, not pitch olive oil, put some olive oil in with the yeast, and then it'll have everything it needs in order to grow. And that's just maybe not the case. And we're going to talk about some of the basics of biology um, on that uh, um, and that pathway. Um, but that's so one of the reasons why uh, this is interesting is it just sort of keeps popping up. I mean, I was recently on a Zoom call with Peter Buchart, um, who's the former head brewer at New Belgium. And he said that Belgian brewers are very commonly skipping oxygenation um, using one and a half mils of olive oil per 100 hectoliters of beer. And they're using that specifically to increase ester production. If you look at a whole bunch of claims around the Internet, there's all these places that say, yeah, you can just put olive oil in beer and you don't have to worry about oxygen at all. And that at all part of this is really where, like you said, the theory just uh, falls apart. So let's talk background biology. So what is a unsaturated fatty acid? Uh, A long hydrocarbon chain, essentially. So it's very hydrophobic. Uh, It's fat, basically, um, with a one charged end. Um, Unsaturated um, just means that it... uh, has some double bonds in it Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to saturated, which is just chock full of hydrogen. Uh, So it's got room to add hydrogen basically is what an unsaturated fatty acid would be. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And and the way I like to think about unsaturated fatty acids is like comparing it against butter, right? Butter is solid at room temperature because it's saturated with hydrogen carbons. So it's got all the hydrogen carbons. (laughs) It's saturated with hydrogen atoms. So it, it looks like if you draw the atom out, it looks flat and you can just stack everything on top of each other. And so it sits nice and uniform um, at room temperature. But the the double bonds, which are in unsaturated fatty acids, that means you're missing some hydrogen atoms in that in that double bond. Uh, they look weird. They bend in all these kinds of weird shapes and sizes. And that means they don't stick together or settle, you know, um, right on top of each other. And that's why olive oil is liquid at room temperature, more or less. That's your crass course in, in unsaturated fatty acids. Um, so that's part of it. Then the other comment that we the, the other compound we talked about Whereas ergosterol, or how? What is ergosterol? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's a sterol is kind of the larger class of molecules, um, and it's very closely related to cholesterol. So whereas uh, mammalian cells, like our cells, have cholesterol in them to kind of uh, get incorporated into the membrane and give that membrane some fluidity for a lot of the reasons you uh, mentioned about uh, unsaturated fatty acids. That's what ergosterol does in yeast. So it's very similar. Like if you look at the molecular structures, there's very little difference between the two, but they are different. Mm -hmm. So ergosterol is essentially yeast cholesterol. I see. So it's coming from yeast, like yeast being a fungus, right? And whereas cholesterol is what we would make as, like you said, mammalian cells, cells, right? So humans or animals would, uh, uh, would produce cholesterol. And so what's the point of these two compounds? Why do the yeast need unsaturated fatty acids and ergosterol? Yeah, both of them are for kind of similar reasons. It's just main, maintaining that fluidity and that flexibility in the membrane, uh, in the plasma membrane. And that's actually, I think, another good uh, thing to talk about right here, too, is a little bit of basics on how that cell on a cell is organized. So the plasma membrane is, you know, this kind of lipid bilayer. So it's fatty molecules that are the fat side is essentially pointed towards each other. And then you got a charged uh, side on the inside and the outside. So that membrane is kind of what defines the cell, you know, the inside and separates it from the environment. Um, and that's where the cholesterol, the ergosterol and the unsaturated fatty acids are and kind of give it some fluidity. It helps it take uh, nutrients up a little more easily. Um, and then there's the cell wall, which I've actually, so when I was re- rereading a lot of this stuff, a lot of people mentioned something about ergosterol and unsaturated, unsaturated fatty acids for the cell wall. It's not right. That we're, this is the plasma membrane. The cell wall is something different. So that's outside the plasma membrane. And that's basically like a collection of proteins and sugars that give the cell some kind of um, mechanical strength and, uh, you know, shape and things like that. But 
uh, they're two different things. Cell wall and the membrane are different things. Uh-huh. We're kind of focused on the membrane here. Yeah, yeah, and the membrane is important, right? I mean, I think it's it's kind of like um, it's it's like a uh, 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 what do we call it? like a I don't know. This is kind of a weird example, but it's like a Ziploc bag. If you put water inside of a Ziploc bag, right? It's like all squishy and it moves around, right? That's a uh, that's how I think of like the membrane. It's that plastic layer of the Ziploc bag. But then if you put that Ziploc bag in you know some kind of a container like a like a plastic, you know, um, I don't know, plastic, what, what's it called? Like Tupperware container. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the cell wall. Right. Um, but, but things in, in a, in a yeast cell and the way that that yeast works is things have to, things are outside of the cell and they've got to get inside of the cell. Right. I mean, think about the way that we eat as humans, we put things in our mouth, we chew it up and swallow it into our stomach. Nothing is like, you know, going through our skin. We're not like absorbing things through our skin, but that is how yeast gets nutrients inside of its cell. It takes it um, and supplement and and brings things, you know, uh, outside through the cell membrane into the middle of the cell. And if it can't do that, if it doesn't have the right, um, let's call it ratios or makeup of that cell membrane, then things don't move easily back and forth. And some great examples of things that don't move back and forth are like sugars, maltose, proteins, um, you know, proteins that yeast can't synthesize, um, you know, um, it, it messes up ion regulation, like, uh, n- you know, sodium and chlorine coming into and out of the cell. So all of these things that yeast needs to survive is totally dependent on the structure of that cell mem- membrane. And like you just mentioned, these compounds, ergosterol and unsaturated fatty acids, are big components of what gives the yeast that fluidity and structure. And if you mess up these ratios, yeast can't grow as well, or maybe just doesn't grow at all, right? Exactly right. Yeah, no, that, that's a, a great description. It's a, yeah, it's a, a physical barrier to the environment, but it's also selective in what it lets in and what it lets out. Yeah, exactly. It's selective, and that selectivity is super important. Um, and so how do these compounds... Um, y- I think you mentioned a little bit that yeast can actually make these compounds, right? Yeast can make unsaturated fatty acids and ergosterol. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Both of the both of those things they can make from kind of progenitor, you know, small smaller molecules and just branch them up, twist them around, do all the things that enzymes do to go through these multi step pathways to make more complicated uh, compounds. So both of those unsatur- unsaturated fatty acids and ergosterol, they can make from scratch, if you will. Yeah, they can make from scratch. And they can also take up these compounds that if they're in the environment, right? If you put yeast into a media that's supplemented with unsaturated fatty acids and ergosterol, the yeast can actually take those into um, its cell wall and, and use those and just immediately use those to strengthen its membrane, right? Exactly right. With both of these things, with unsaturated fatty acid and ergosterol, you could supplement. So, you know, the way that we would kind of prove that scientifically is you'd break one of the genes necessary to make these things and say, if we just feed the yeast this compound, is it still alive, still growing? Uh, and yes, we can do that with both of these things. So we could, you could break the cell's ability to make ergosterol. You could break the cell's ability to make unsaturated fatty acids. And if you supplement both those things, yeast doesn't care. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think this is where the research sort of, um, gets mixed up, right? This is where things get tangled up because you and I've been very careful on this show to say that you need both ergosterol and unsaturated fatty acids. Right. Um, and I think this is where sort of things, things start to get mixed up. I see a lot of claims on um, the internet that says that unsaturated fatty acids are a substitute for oxygen in terms of this ability for yeast to produce ergosterol and uh, unsaturated fatty acids. But that's not the case, is it? No, and both of the both unsaturated fatty acids and ergosterol are completely unrelated, have completely different biosynthetic pathways. Uh, they both happen to require oxygen, but they're unrelated. They're just two different compounds, two different pathways. Yeah, exactly. Right. They're, they're two totally different pathways. So so, with you know, without sort of getting too far off into the weeds there, um, you know, how does yeast synthesize these things? It makes it takes oxygen and then it, you know, puts some stuff together <laughs> and out comes UFAs and ergosterol. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like with UFAs, it's essentially starting with, uh, you know, like acyl-CoAs. I mean, just smaller molecules that they just link together and they get longer and longer chains. Uh, you know, some enzymes will then 
uh, rip out you know, hydrogen molecules to give you the double bond so that you get those twists. I mean, it just depends on the unsaturated fatty acid. Mm -hmm. uh, but the I think the basic premise is that it's building it up from smaller uh, building blocks and, you know, breaking and reconnecting different bonds and all the things that enzymes do uh, in a cell. Yeah, yeah. And then ergosterol is a little bit of a different pathway, right? I mean, just totally unrelated. It's, it's not even related to UFAs. It's a totally different synthesis. How does that work? Um, yeah, I wouldn't even... Con uh, well, I mean, it, it's similar in that it is starting with, you know, the smaller molecules and building them up. And, and, and really, it's kind of a similar story. It starts with smaller molecules and it builds it up and uh, disconnects and reconnects bonds, and at the end of it, you've got this uh, sterol, uh, as a which is much different looking, more like ring structures to it mm. uh, compared to you know like a fatty acid, which is mostly a, a chain of hydrocarbons. I see, and both of these require oxygen, right? If the yeast wants to synthesize these by building up these chains, oxygen is required. Right. In the, in the UFA pathway, there is essentially one enzyme called only one. And it's, uh, they talk about that in one of the papers that I mentioned in this article, the Decker paper, but, um, that is the enzyme that requires oxygen. It uses oxygen to carry out this enzymatic reaction, uh, where oh, I had that written down where it, it basically takes, um, the, uh, palmitoyl CoA, stereol CoA to make palmitoyl oil. Ah, man, palmitol the oil. <laughs> there you uh, go. <laughs> oh, yeah, just takes these two compounds and uses oxygen to uh, attach those two and make a longer uh, compound. So, yeah, oxygen, absolutely essential for that enzyme to do that. Mm -hmm. And then same so, or similar story for ergosterol, right? That, I mean, that, that oxygen is also required in that synthesis. Right. So, I mean, I think uh, there's something like 19 enzymes required to make uh, ergosterol. Whoa. And uh, there's uh, when it gets to squalene, which is like halfway through the pathway, that's when it takes uh, molecular oxygen and uh, through an enzymatic reaction makes the squalene, uh, squalene epoxide. So uh, it needs oxygen to make squalene epoxide. Yeah. Uh, and as an aside, there was actually a point when I was looking over these pathways where it looked like draniol was involved in like, wait, draniol has an oxygen. Maybe, maybe the key to this is taking olive oil you know, for UFAs and draniol for, um, for the, you know, the substrate partway through the ergosterol pathway. And then uh, I was unfortunately found out that that the oxygen requiring step is post draniol. So oh, okay. Even, okay. And then, and, it, and the thing is, if you look at everything that comes from uh, or every step that comes after all the oxygen that's needed, you're effectively at ergosterol. So there's nothing you can do to supplement that pathway that doesn't require oxygen. So, so to make, so to synthesize ergosterol, you can't make it without oxygen. Right. Not yeah. It's uh, completely impossible. It actually apparently takes 12 moles of oxygen per ergosterol molecule. I mean, it's a lot of oxygen. Yeah. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a biochemist, so I don't actually even know uh, well, it's not incorporating all these oxygens because there's still only one oxygen molecule in an ergosterol, mm -hmm. uh, but it somehow these enzymes require molecular oxygen to carry out their um, functions. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because, you know, I mean, the oxygen's, you know, the conservation of mass, right? Everything, the oxygen's used, it doesn't go into the final molecule, but it's used somehow and then released back into the atmosphere or whatever, you know, really ba released back into uh, the surrounding area. But that's interesting. You use 12 moles per uh, per mole of ergosterol. So that's like a 12 to one. So for each molecule of ergosterol, you re it requires 12 molecular oxygen. So then it sounds like if you supplemented a wort with olive oil, but not oxygen, then uh, uh, the yeast wouldn't have any way to make ergosterol, right? It wouldn't survive. That's the problem. That's the problem. And that's why it all breaks down. Well, and I had another question that was raised um, the, whenever we was talking about this uh, with some folks. And it was, you know, olive oil has unsaturated fatty acids, but those unsaturated fat fatty acids are bound up in a molecule called a triglyceride. I mean, basically, a triglyceride is three unsaturated fatty acids that are bound together. It looks kind of like a like a funny looking jellyfish if you draw it out. Like mm. there's a jellyfish head on the top and then like three tentacles hanging down and you can have different unsaturated fatty acids as each of those tentacles. But the fatty acids are the tentacles of the jellyfish, but they're still bound um, in, in triglyceri triglycerides. Can, can yeast even release 
unfast, unsaturated fatty acids from the olive oil triglyc- triglycerides? Yeah, they do. They have enzymes uh, that can that can cleave those and make them more accessible to the yeast. And actually, the the Decker paper again that we'll talk more detail about later. Uh, they're using what we would call polysorbate eighty or tween eighty. Um, it's kind of a detergent uh, that's got, uh, but it's it's main fatty acid associated with it is oleic acid. So it actually has to in order to use that that from tween, it has to clip that off. Uh, uh, so there's a little processing involved. I see. Yeah, but so essentially, then yeah, if you you know yeast can get unsaturated fatty acids out of out of olive oil. So again, we're sort of confirming the fact that olive oil can be used to supplement unsaturated fatty acids, right? And that's what you said at the top of the show, right? We agree that that can happen. The problem is that's not everything that the yeast needs. Yeast also needs ergosterol um, in order to have this cell wall or cell membrane um, regulation or permeability, and so that sort of seems to be the problem. Well, there were three studies uh, that that sort of looked into this issue. So there was a new Belgium brewing company um, study that was done. I, I think we looked it up before the show, but I forgot to look, write it down. It was in 2005, um, and right. it was a, a master's thesis by a student called Grady Hull, who was doing his master's um, at Harriet Watt. Um, and then I myself did a brulosophy experiment uh, where I added olive oil in a Kolsch in one batch and no olive oil in the other. Um, and then the, the, the folks over at Experimental Brewings, Denny and Drew, had their Igors, which is their ti- their um, team of homebrewing scientists, go off and do an experiment on olive oil, uh, which all had some uh, pretty interesting results, but they all suffer from this whole um, understanding of UFAs and ergosterol. So I want to spend some time talking about those experiments, and it's perfect time to take a break before we do that. So let's do that. We'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. The idea of adding olive oil to wort in place of oxygen is interesting because we've learned that yeast need unsaturated fatty acids to support growth. And olive oil, turns out, has a lot of unsaturated fatty acids in triglyceride form. But unsaturated fatty acids aren't the only compound needed. Yeast also need ergosterol, and they need oxygen to make ergosterol. So Lance, I use oil of olive oil all the time um, in my cooking, <laughs> and I've played around with it in beer, but it still feels, feels weird to me to put cooking oil in my beer. And I, like, how does you feel about it? Should it feel weird? Um, I mean, you know, not really, I guess. I mean, we're talking about, you know, pretty small amounts. So yeah. it's not, you know, I think the people who have played around with it have noted that it has no effect on flavor, it has no effect on, you know, uh, foam retention or anything like that. Um, so, you know, if it's a, supplying something the yeast needs, we shouldn't feel too weird about it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, I, there's always just something like, I don't know. I mean, sub, I'll substitute olive oil when I bake or, you know, make things. And I always just expect to have that, like, olive oil flavor or that character. Um, and I've used olive oil in beer and that that has never come through. And like you said, it's in really small amounts, um, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, so I suppose we should start with this, the study that got this whole thing kicked off, right? Um, and that was the New Belgian study. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that study? Uh, so this was, yeah, performed at New Belgium. They actually, uh, you know, uh, beer everybody's going to know who listens to this, uh, fat tire. So this was actually involving production runs of uh, fat tire, um, but to basically test the theory that oleic acid from olive oil uh, can provide any sort of UFAs necessary for yeast growth, uh, thereby eliminating the need for uh, wort aeration. So, you know, again, we're... And that's, a, that's kind of a big part, right? Like eliminating the need for wort aeration. This is the sticking yeah. point that we, that, that we have, right? Right. And, and there's, you know, it's again kind of ignoring the contribution of ergosterol. Although to be fair, at the end of that thesis, there is 
discussion about ergosterol. So they, I think they did recognize the fact that, um, uh, you know, we're, this isn't the whole story. And it talked about, you know, future studies could include ergosterol, but I do feel like that probably could have been mentioned earlier uh, and just and had some discussion around how these are independent. And that probably would have actually, uh, you know, helped for the years that followed where people kind of ran with this without taking into consideration both of those things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think I think it is important. And you're absolutely right. There is a section on ergosterol, but you're right. It's at, it's at the end um, of the of the paper. And so I think the big takeaways were, were, you know, well, we'll get to the takeaways in a minute. But they used olive oil in the beer in order to eliminate wort aeration. I mean, that's kind of what it says right up at the front. You know, it would be interesting too for whatever if you, if people decide to do future research on this, it would be interesting to see how ergosterol, um, you know, impacts this. And there is a study that you talk about that we'll get to in a minute. We've mentioned it a couple times already. The Decker study where they they looked at some of the impact that ergosterol has. Um, so this is so what what uh, they did at New Belgium is pretty cool. So they they had their propagation tanks, their yeast propagation tanks with their which they're constantly um, using to make sure that they have yeast that's ready to pitch um, so their control in this case were just beers that had aeration in line according to the normal New Belgium fat tire specification so that's getting oxygen um, and then they did a sort of three separate batch sizes at three different dosing rates so they would add olive oil into the yeast proper propagation tank five hours before pitching, and then they had three different batch sizes. So 360 hectoliters, 720 hectoliters, and 2100 hectoliters. And they would change the olive oil amount based on the number of cells uh, that was added. So in that smallest batch, 360 hectoliters. So remember, a normal home brew size batch is about uh, 20 liters. And so so this is a huge size volume whenever you're talking about like a normal home brew batch. They used 1.5 milligrams per liter. Um, so one milligram per 67 billion cells. And then as the cell count, um, you know, got higher and higher or, um, you know, batch size got bigger and bigger, they added more olive oil per cells. So the middle one, 720, got one milligram per 50 billion cells. And then the large one, 2100 um, hectoliters, got one milligram uh, per 25 billion cells. Um, so why don't you talk us through their results? Yeah, I, I mean that that's a, a, a good good setup. Um, so they uh, what they saw was longer fermentation time. So it ranged, uh, and it seemed to ra- range depending on the kind of the dosage. So at, at first they were seeing twenty percent longer fermentation times um, with olive oil, no oxygenation. In the later experiments, is more on the order of thirteen to fourteen mm-hmm. percent uh, longer fermentation times. Terminal gravities were within their Kind of expected uh, and acceptable ranges. Uh, they did detect elevated ester content by GCMS, but uh, when they did tasting panels, um, couldn't necessarily you know see that difference in the panel, or even actually sometimes they saw slight preferences for the slightly fruitier uh, versions. But you know nothing crazy from that. Um, uh, but they never did repitch the yeast from that, which I think is one of the yeah things that makes it inconclusive and i i was thinking about this today and i think another uh control that was kind of missing here was no olive oil no aeration so <laughs> yeah. i, mean, I think mm-hmm. we need that third control because how can you even say that the olive oil did anything with ex- this experimental setup unless you have another one where you don't do oxygenation or olive oil right uh yeah so that that i think you know because so what we're looking when we see this 20 percent longer fermentation 13 percent we don't know for certain whether that has to do with, you know, uh, the, the, the yeast that was used in that particular batch, the fermenter geometry was different and all these, there are other variables too. So I think, you know, when we're missing that kind of third treatment, uh, there's not much we can conclude from this, yeah. uh, and other than it's definitely not equivalent. We know that from this. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, the, the, but the, and the, the takeaways from this are interesting, right? The olive oil one, which you would think, again, by spiking uh, olive oil in here, you're giving the yeast the unsaturated fatty acids, so it doesn't need to go down that that synthesis or that biosynthesis pathway. So you would think, hey, that might speed up fermentation times. But they didn't see that at New Belgium. And so I think that's sort of, you know, that's kind of a tick against, okay, well, we're doing this to help the yeast. And if we're having longer fermentations, um, you know, that's not necessarily an indicator 
indicator that it's that it's helping. But again, you're right. We're missing this sort of negative control. Now, the one thing that that um, was interesting is uh, the tasting panel didn't necessarily detel- detect any differences, right? For the for the most part, or like you said, they even and may have had some preferences for slightly fruitier versions of Fat Tire, even if there were elevated esters. Um, and then again, the third one, uh, the final one, no re- repitching of yeast. I think that's another big one as well, and that's kind of a fatal flaw um, through all of the experiments, as we'll see. Um, so I wanted to jump then next to the experiment that I did uh, with Brewlosophy. And so my research question was, um, I was I saw this, um, saw people talking about this, um, you know, thesis from Grady Hull and the New Belgium experiment. I was curious how a beer dosed at a homebrew scale um, with olive oil might compare to one that wasn't aerated at all. Um, and so I decided to test this out for myself. Um, I brewed a Kolsch beer um, and at yeast pitch, um, well, first of all, I should say I brewed a Kolsch, Kolsch beer according to like my normal standard practice at the time, um, which involves racking out of the uh, kettle and just kind of splashing it into the fermenter, right? So there's some oxygenation that's happening while I'm racking the the uh, beer into the fermenter, but I'm not actually like oxygenating in line. I'm not using an oxygenation wand or adding any um, pure oxygen to the fermenter. That's just kind of my normal standard package. Um, and then at pitch, I pitched um, fresh pouches. That's an important one. Fresh pouches of Imperial's uh, GO3 Dieter uh, into each batch. So each batch got a fresh patch fr- from the manufacturer. And then one batch got eight milliliters of olive oil, which is, remember I said, I said 1.5 mi- um, uh, micrograms, right? Milligrams. No, 1.5 milligrams per liter. Um, I added eight milliliters of olive oil, which is just a ridiculously large, <laughs> larger um, amount. Uh, and neither batch was oxygenated except for that normal splashing uh, during transfer. And when I did that experiment, I actually saw that the beer dosed with olive oil fermented faster. It started earlier and it finished actually two two days earlier than the non-dose batch. Um, Just like New Belgium, both gravities were identical. um, Or, I mean... I should say that separately. My gravities were identical. New Belgium's may not have been identical, but they were within the spec range of what fat tires should be at. Um, and then I served to tasters. I served to 21 tasters, and we do a triangle test. So that's two cups of the olive oil dosed beer and one cup of the non-dosed beer. And in that study, you would have needed eight to achieve statistical significance, but only got five correct, which is a p-value of point. Uh, eight eight, um, and so that's so that was sort of my results. So if you look at the results that I saw in that study, one tasters weren't able to tell a difference even with a crap load of olive oil in there. Um, uh, the beer started to ferment faster, um, and it finished two days earlier. So those seem to be interesting points, but I think there's a couple of problems um, with the experiment, and I'll let you go through those because you pointed those out on top crop. Yeah, I mean, one of the if if somebody had come to me and said this is my experimental setup, you know, what what uh, what would you change? What would you consider? Uh, the the one thing that I would definitely have considered would be to actually just physically combine those two packs of yeast, mm-hmm. shake them up so they're all confluent, and you know that I mean, yes, they can be from the same lot, they can be from the they're the same strain, obviously all that but you know in transit one of them could have been right next to the ice pack and that affected viability I, it's just it just makes that a variable right yeah, now yeah. now you can't say with certainty that these two things i pitched are identical uh so it makes it hard to say that to make your conclusion say it's it's solely because of the um uh, olive oil so i mean it right. seems ridiculous to say that like it's the same law it's the same yeast but uh yeah, it's, it's, it's a yeah. possibility and it just makes it hard to make any firm conclusions yeah no for sure and i mean we talk about that a lot at, at brulosophy i mean you'll see most of our brulosophy experiments even yeast ones are going to have um two packs of fresh yeast and that's just because of discussions that we've had with imperial yeast and also we're comfortable with the assumptions that the lot variability is going to be the same for at least the purposes that we're doing in brulosophy but it's absolutely a valid criticism right um that that we should have mixed these yeast um together so that there's no differences because for example, exactly like uh, Lance is saying, that beer might have started fermenting earlier because it just was, you know, bed, better quality yeast in that pack for whatever reason during shipping or storage or, you know, how it was, you know, transported in my car on the way home from the homebrew stop uh, shop. Any of those things um, could have impacted that. But again, uh, you know, another what, what I'm learning is a critical design flaw of this, um, this uh, study is this is also... Uh, you know, fresh yeast that is hasn't been propagated. It hasn't been reused. 
through generations, right? This is just um, fresh yeast from the manufacturer. So it's already got its ergosterol and its um, UFAs. And then you're pitching it into um, a wort that is going to have some oxygen, maybe not oxygenated, but the yeast itself is going to have had enough to start growing and budding and then ferment. It would be interesting to see successive uses of this or successive pitches where we take the yeast from that beer, pitch it again into another uh, beer, and then do it again and do it again without oxygen and see what happens, right? Because that's where that ergosterol limitation is going to come out, right, Lance? Exactly. Yeah. It's a successive re and they're essentially diluting their gastrol out with their daughter cells. So uh, the longer you go, the more problems you're going to have. Uh, but uh, I mean, also something we'll discuss in that Decker paper is our, even just our kind of handling, normal handling of the, the yeast is introducing some oxygen that kind of gives them a little bit of a spark uh, each time you have to go through again, as we'll discuss unreasonable extremes to keep it <laughs> truly anaerobic. Uh, so, I mean, like even your, your normal splashing, you were somewhat oxygenated too. So, yeah. uh, I mean, that would be another variable here is you're not really testing an anoxic environment. Yeah. You're testing kind of a low oxygen environment. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, as we can discuss later, it's hard to do this. And I mean, like I, we're not set up to do this properly here. Yeah. Uh, and we have, you know, lab equipment here uh, to, <laughs> to truly keep oxygen out. It's, it's surprisingly difficult. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and there's some questions too that I have at the end about, you know, how much oxygen really would matter, right? Like how much is that, that splashing um, going to add, you know, is that splashing doing enough of oxygen so that then ergosterol synthesis, you know, uh, jumps off. If you're looking at a, bre a brewery like New Belgium, for, or for example, you know, from the yeast propagation tank, if they're not adding any oxygen whenever they're going straight from the line into the beer, you know, that might be uh, more of an issue. Uh, but but there was one other experiment. I don't want to skip over it as the Imperial Brewing um, uh, or sorry, Imperial <laughs> um, Experimental Brewing Igor's experiment. So Denny and Drew's um, Denny Khan and Drew Beecham's uh, group of Igor's doing this. And so their re research question was, and I'll quote from their website, it says Grady's experiment was to see, OK, can we skip over the sterile synthesis synthesis part and directly give yeast their needed sterols convenient source of sterols that's cheap as hell oil and the bonuses you need very little oil to deliver the necessary amounts of sterols for optimum yeast condition let's try it so that was their uh that was their uh their experimental uh question and so they did they had six igors uh go out and do this they brewed an amber l recipe which is similar to fat tire they added 50 microliters of olive oil so again way less than what i added i added eight milliliters um, they added 50 microliters, which is much more consistent um, with what uh, New Belgium uh, New Belgium did. Um, they didn't have a lot of details about yeast pitching or oxygenation or aeration, uh, but they did have their Igors serve the beer to tasters, and the tasters were unable to perceive a difference um, in those six different um, experiments. So that's still that's actually the third um, you know example that we've had where tasters weren't able to taste a difference with a beer that's used with olive oil. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, if if you're listening along at this point, you might be thinking I'm full of crap. I keep telling you that you, <laughs> you, you, you're like, sure, of course you can use uh, olive oil and get everything you need. Um, but, you know, again, I think there are good reasons why up to this stage we haven't, you know, people haven't taken that next step to, to really test this. Um, and, and that is to how is this yeast going to perform if we you know, repitch it. And if we, and we don't oxygenate, we only have olive oil and we take that yeast from there and repitch that again, try to do this for eight generations. What are we looking at? Mm -hmm. um, uh, from, from the work that we're going to talk about from Decker, I think is we'll, yeah, we'll see why that falls apart. Let's do it. I think it's a perfect time to talk about Decker. This is one, um, uh, a, a Decker um, is the lead author on the, on the article. So I'll let you um, talk about it. Yeah. So they essentially wanted to, uh, see what you, you know what kind of growth you could get with supplementation what you needed to supplement in uh, anaerobic growth chambers and i mean one of the things that i found uh, fascinating about this was how to what extent they had to go to make <laughs> something to see these effects i mean they were using uh, a you know bioreactor that they were flushing ultra pure nitrogen into the headspace keeping <laughs> it under some top pressure 
using special tubing that would prevent any sort of uh, uptake of oxygen. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, they're doing uh, so again, you can see like what, you know, why you can't do this kind of anywhere. You have to have all this special stuff. Otherwise, <laughs> oxygen finds itself in there, right? Yeah, like yeah. It, it gets in there and it, and it screws up your results because it doesn't take a lot to kind of uh, goose some of these reactions. So, um, so that's, that's what they had to do. And, and they actually, uh, when they're doing testing to see whether they needed supplementation, they would have to do an initial anaerobic growth. And then uh, they'd see growth in there unsupplemented. So they'd have anaerobic growth, no, uh, no unsaturated fatty acids or ergosterol added, uh, and it would still grow. So, you're, so at this point, you're like, wow, they don't, they don't need anything. They're fine without anything. Uh, but they can take that uh, yeast from that reaction, put it in another uh, transfer it to another um, reaction and ask for growth. And that's when they just see no growth without supplementation. So they'd have to, so they call that a carryover effect. Um, so when they're growing this, this yeast initially in their aerobic conditions, the, the yeasts are chock full of ergosterol and sterol. They transfer them to anaerobic and, and they can basically divide that out into their daughter cells up to a point. Uh, so that's kind of what they're discovering is that point. Like uh, there's at some point there they've diluted these things out so far that growth ceases. Yeah, exactly. So the, yeah, so they they've 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 essentially just been repitching the yeast under anaerobic conditions without supplementing UFAs, unsaturated fatty acids, without supplementing ergosterol. And at some point they reached it where the yeast stopped growing. It didn't have what it needed um, in order to grow. And that <clears throat> and they kept the control, right? The control going through this whole time. Each successive pitch of the control gets supplemented with oxygen and it just, you know, lives on in perpetuity like a propagation chamber and like brewers have been doing for hundreds of years. Um, but when you take those things, UFAs and ergosterol, away from the yeast, yeah, they stop growing. And that's pretty cool. And there was also a really interesting finding um, that, that they did. So they said, okay, we've now got these yeast pitches um, that aren't growing or at least have stalled growth. What happens now if we add ergosterol back in? Uh, so what happened there? Right. Yeah, so when they added ergosterol back, uh, mind you, they're not adding UFAs back. They actually saw uh, growth again. <laughs> uh, so uh, the the conclusion there is under anaerobic condition, to, it almost seemed not even fully necessary to have the UFAs. Yeah. So uh, it was ergosterol that had caused them to stop growing. And if they supplemented that, the yeast took off and they got really good biomass from it again even though there are no unsaturated fatty acids. And they, uh, they would uh, look at, examine the yeast at the end for uh, unsaturated fatty acids within the membranes and didn't see them. So it's not like there is a little bit of oxygen leakage that was enough to uh, get them to make some unsaturated fatty acids. They uh, didn't detect them in the cell. So uh, their conclusion was that surprisingly under anaerobic conditions, they didn't even seem, it didn't even seem like UFAs are an absolute requirement Huh. Um, but, but they did, and I think prior work had also established that aerobic growth, uh, uh, if you have, say, for example, the broken only one gene, uh, which uses the oxygen to make UFAs, you have to supplement UFAs for that, uh, yeast to grow. Um, so we, we know under, um, aerobic conditions, they do need UFAs and if they can't make themselves, you have to supplement it, but it seems to be a little different under anaerobic under anaerobic conditions. See, this is, I say that, I feel like I say this all the time on the Brew Lab pod, podcast is this, this is fascinating, right? Um, um, and, and I think, you know, this is, to me, this is one of the biggest and most exciting things to take away from this whole episode is, is that these, the, the, the yeast, when you didn't supplement with uh, UFAs and ergosterol, they stopped growing, add the ergosterol back in and they start growing again. Like, so you said, it, it kind of indicates at least in their paper that ergosterol might be the one that uh, determines whether or not yeast grow again with that in in under anaerobic condi conditions um that coupled with the aerobic uh research saying under aerobic conditions they do have to have uh ufas but this kind of highlights all of the problem um with the three different experiments right that we talked about and all of the discussion online about olive oil and oxygenation and trying to replace oxygenation totally um with olive oil. And you had a really awesome um, quote. Um, and you said, brewers are using cultures that already have adequate stores of ergosterol and fatty acids. If brewers tried to harvest from the cropped yeast in the olive oil only batches and repitch, 
that's where they're going to start to see problems because ergosterol will be depleted and growth will cease. And so this is the case in every experiment that we've seen here with uh, with uh, the New Belgium and Grady Hull's research. They were supplementing um, in their yeast po- propagation tanks and then pitching one batch with that yeast. That yeast was then discarded and not used in successive repitches. In mine, I used fresh yeast. One of them got supplemented um, with uh, with uh, olive oil, but that yeast was discarded. It wasn't repitched. Um, and then the, it's unclear clear about whether or not that happened with the experimental brewing Igors, but I think we can assume because it wasn't expressly stated that some people did that, um, that, that they didn't, um, that they didn't do that. So it's interesting, right? We've got, um, a, 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 what I, what I feel like is a question, right? It's, um, it's, it's what, you know, well, is olive oil even worth it? <laughs> right? Yeah. And- and I don't, you know, I don't, I, it's not going to hurt. Like, right. I don't think you're, you know, we, uh, there's plenty of science out there that shows that yeast can uh, take UFAs from the environment and use them. So it's never going to hurt to supplement. Uh, they'll, they'll take them up, they'll use them. Um, but I, yeah, I hope what you can see is that without oxygen, they cannot make ergosterol yeah. and olive oil does not supply ergosterol. So unless you have some supplementation of ergosterol, you know, you're going to, you're going to have problems. I mean, all of the experiments that we've talked about to use the terminology of the Decker paper used carryover cultures. Mm -hmm. And even in that paper, when they took an aerobic culture and put it in an anaerobic chamber, they still grew because they had uh, enough stores to produce daughter cells to an extent. So uh, with all these studies, the next step would be cropping that yeast and, and, and repitching it then. And that's when I think you'd really start to obviously I mean, you have, you'd have a 2,100 hectoliter batch of fat tire that's uh, <laughs> stalling out, barely starting fermentation Yeah. Uh, once you pitch third generation, something like that. And I yeah. can see why they wouldn't want to do that. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good point, right? <laughs> But maybe there's an opportunity to do that, like in some, you know, lab conditions or something Um, like you said, like, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, it'd be tough because, again, you have to have that that just totally anaerobic environment where there's no oxygen getting in. I mean, even in a flask, right, even if you were in a one liter flask doing a, a, you know, a a fermentation, that headspace oxygen is going to be probably enough um, to to produce at least some ergosterol. To produce some, but I, I mean, I would wager that even if you did carry this out, you know, even at a, a homebrew type of setup or in our lab setup, you're going to see problems. They're, they're, they're not going to ferment, you know, quickly or to completion um, doing this, even when you can't fully keep oxygen out of the system. Yeah. Uh, Cause I think th- they're going to need more. I mean, like we talked about, you need 12 moles of oxygen per molecule of ergosterol. It's quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so at some point you are going to be depleted. You're going to have unhealthy yeast. Yeah. Yeah. At some point you're going to get there. And that was one of those questions I was going to ask. I think I mentioned it earlier, but it's like, is there enough oxygen that's incorporated during transfer, you know, to make ergosterol? And I think the question on there, the, the, the answer there is one of my favorite lawyer answers. I can say this talking to another lawyers. It depends, right? If you're, <laughs> if you're splashing all over the place in a five gallon fermenter, then yeah, maybe there's enough oxygen there to make ergosterol. If you're transferring from a yeast propagation tank to a 2100 hectoliter batch, probably not, right? Or not even from a propagation tank, from, you know, carrying over from 2100 hectoliters to another 2100 hectoliters to another to another, you know, yeah, uh, at at some point, no, there's not going to be enough oxygen in that wort. There's probably some strain dependency there, too. I mean, what we see with a lot of things with yeast is there's big time strain dependency, and like some of them seem like they need more oxygen than others. But I mean, I think think any of them, if you tried to carry this out, you know, eight to nine generations with uh, very good control over oxygen and depriving them of it, it's it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and I, I mean, that's such a just a cool takeaway from this experiment too, right? Or for, from uh, from what you wrote here on on Top Crop and your deep dive into it. I love it, right? Because we start by saying, okay, can we add olive oil and eliminate oxygenation? Um, and the answer to that is probably not, right? It is because there's two pieces. There's the unsaturated fatty acids and there's ergosterol. And oxygen is absolutely required for ergosterol synthesis. Um, and when you when I read this article, I remember it just kind of all clicked together for me as like, oh, okay, 
that makes sense. And so then I start to think about, you know, brewers like Peter Deck, Peter, Peter Buchart, um, who are, you know, in Belgium, you know, supplementing one and a half milligrams per liter or per hectoliter of olive oil um, and then not oxygenating. I wonder how they're making the beer. There's got to be some other way that oxygen is getting in there, maybe because they're fermenting in, in uh, futures. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's an open fermentation. Uh, I would be very curious to know what they're doing uh, just to, to see, because, I mean, again, we know you know, scientifically, you need <laughs> oxygen to make ergosterol. Yeast need ergosterol. Yeah. So if they're if they're doing what they say they're doing and going, you know, 10 generations out and fermentation seem fine, they're getting oxygen from somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, yeah. They cannot grow without it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned that too, right? Like like Saccharomyces cerevisiae has been studied for hundreds of years, right? I mean, we, we know, well, maybe not hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. We can say hundreds at this point. Yeah. It's been studied for a long time. It's probably, if not the most, it's one of the most well-studied microorganisms on the planet. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so we can say really pretty convincingly that ergosterol requires oxygen. It's just been proven a number of times. Um, and so that's cool. Hey, well, um, Lance, we've talked about a whole bunch of stuff today um, on olive oil and oxygenation. If you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, what would it be? Um, that olive oil is not going to hurt anything. Um, but you know, if, if your goal it's, but it's not going to replace oxygen, essentially, that's it. Olive oil, uh, can supplant the need for, um, unsaturated fatty acids, but it's, uh, not going to replace the need for, uh, oxygen because of the need for oxygen in the synthesis of ergosterol. Um, you could go out if now, if you go out and you find olive oil and ergosterol, Absolutely. Uh, you could do that. But um, there is not a cheap source of ergosterol. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess we kind of did skip over that, right? Like ergosterol, I'm sure there's not a, like a, a cheap manufacturer or a good source of ergosterol because that's it's from, you know, fungi. It's from, you know, yeast and, and, and that that uh, um, uh, kingdom, I guess, maybe. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I mean, that'd be, you know, maybe somebody can come up with some cheap source of it and then we could and maybe the there'd be a point where the uh, shelf life effects, you know, uh, of not having oxygen kind of make up for the fact that it's slight more, slightly more expensive to produce the beer. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the number I had, and again, this is when I did the math probably like a year ago, something like $11 a barrel uh, <laughs> to hit the ergosterol <laughs> level. Yeah. I mean, it's not, not insignificant uh, to get the levels of ergosterol that they were supplementing with in that Decker paper. Yeah. Um, yeah. And oxygen is not that expensive. Yeah. I mean, $11 a barrel, that's pretty expensive. I mean, if you go to a brewer and tell them that they need to do that just to avoid oxygen, they're going to say, no, <laughs> nice, yeah. nice try. All that oxygen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're not doing that. <laughs> uh, well, interesting. Cool. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Lance. Is, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about olive oil or oxygenation that we didn't get to? No, I think we hit it. And I, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I hope that this kind of, I don't know, doesn't, uh, well, the answer is kind of the, what I felt like was missing. Every time I saw this, there was the, the conflation of um, ergosterol and UFAs. And I, so what I hope people understand is they're two different things. Both require oxygen, olive oil only supplements one of those things Mm -hmm. um so you know it'd be fun if somebody actually took this up and and showed that you know once yeah once i get to third or fourth generation of supplementing only olive oil now it's everything's falling apart like it's yeah and do the the controls along the way too right uh um, to kind of show this in practice uh or to see what those limits are how how long can they go when it's just you know a little bit of environmental oxygen leaking in i you know i don't have those answers yeah Uh, and i know if i were brewery i wouldn't screw around with it Um, (laughs) exactly but somebody should yeah somebody should maybe maybe there's a scientist out there that's willing to do it or or some way that we can you know a small scale uh brewer that's got some uh, additional time on their hands or something like that it would be a lot of fun to see but like you said i you know i think the big takeaway from this is olive oil isn't going to hurt anything and it'll certainly supplement ufas but that's not the whole picture right again that's not to say that any of these experiments are wrong in what they did it's just not the whole picture right there's other things that are going on and that's the purpose that's the point um, of what i was hoping we would communicate from this show and i hope that's a takeaway that listeners um, will get from it as well well lance thank you so much for joining me today and thank you so much for doing this research and for writing about it on top crop Um, and again thanks for joining me in the brew lab
It's glad to be here. It's fun. Thanks. Yeah. Well, listeners in the show notes, you're going to find a link to Top Crop. I encourage you to spend some time, uh, time, time there and check it out. The link will go directly to Lance's article, but there's a whole bunch of different stuff on that blog. They share information all about modern brewing science. It's really awesome, and you should definitely check it out. Uh, and if you're interested in other content, uh, you know, please go ahead and check out Brewlosophy.com, and don't forget to listen to our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit Patreon.com slash Brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.